after we have talked about two deterministic latent variable models, we are now going to talk about the first probabilistic latent variable model that we treat, which is a variational autoencoder, one of the most popular models, most popular generative models today. So far we have discussed these deterministic models, but now we will take a probabilistic perspective on latent variable models with autoencoding properties. Consider again the following Bayesian model of the data x. This is the equation from the introduction to this lecture. Where we have a generative process with a prior on the latent variables and a likelihood x given c. And integrating that over c yields the marginal or the data likelihood p of x. And that is what we want to optimize. That is one of what we want to maximize. And of course we can, because we have the probability of C here and we integrate over C, this expression here is simply the expectation of the conditional likelihood X given C with respect to the variable C drawn from the prior distribution. Now, in order to develop this model, we make some assumptions that are needed in order to make this model tractable. We first assume that the prior model P of C is sampleable and computable. And we also assume that the likelihood model P of X given C, this conditional likelihood is also computable. What that means is we can sample from P of C, we can draw samples from P of C. P is a simple enough distribution that we can query samples from it. And we can compute also the probability mass or the density of P of C and P of X given C for any given X and any given C. These assumptions, as we've seen, hold true for autoregressive models, such as language models, but they fail for many other models, such as loopy graphical models, um, where approximations such as belief propagation, propagation must be used. In the context of variational autoencoders, we will consider very simple parametric distributions like Gaussians that are parameterized through neural networks to achieve this property that it's easy to sample from. Now, in order to find the model parameters W, the best model parameters W, a sensible thing to do is to minimize the negative log likelihood or the cross entropy, um, and this is the first expression here. So we want to find W star as the minimizer of the expectation over the entire data distribution. So X are samples from the data distribution, this is our data set of minus log and the data likelihood. And now we are using a subscript W um, for the distributions to indicate that these distributions depend on some parameters. In some way, they depend on parameters w that we want to optimize. Now, this expression is simply the uh, expectation of the conditional likelihood with respect to c, as we have seen. And we can, uh, of course, uh, replace this expectation here with um, the summation over the entire data set as usual. So we obtain this expression here where now x has an index i. <clears throat> okay, now unfortunately, given our assumptions, computing p w of x is still intractable. Computing this expectation is still intractable because um, the search space is too high. We need to um, draw too many samples from the distribution on C, from a very broad distribution on a latent space. We're not operating on a one-dimensional latent space. We're operating maybe on a 60-dimensional a latent space. So it's a very large dimensional latent space. It's smaller than the observation space, but it's still large. And so in order to 
properly estimate their quantity, we need to draw a lot of samples, too many samples for making a single gradient step. So it's intractable. And the idea of VAEs is to sidestep this problem by introducing another model component, a so-called recognition model that's also parameterized by some parameters w and it's called qw because it's only an approximation. It's qw of c given x. So given a data point x, we're trying to encode that data point with a probabilistic model. We're trying to find the distribution over c, a model that predicts the distribution over c given the data point. In the context of autoencoders, this is the encoder. P of x given c is the decoder, and Q of c given x is the encoder. And we try to train that approximate model such that it approximates the true unknown posterior, P w of c given x. This is the true posterior that also depends on these parameters of this model, of course, but that is unknown. We don't have access to that true posterior. So we're trying to approximate it with a recognition model that tries to be close to a posterior, but it doesn't need to be precise. It can be a, a crude approximation and is still useful. Let's gain some intuition for this intractability that I've just mentioned. Imagine the observations being sound waves and the latents to be word sequences. So imagine you're listening to a song and you want to uh, recognize what was said in that song. In other words, we're looking for a theory of the sound waves that best explains them. We're looking for the spoken words that have generated these sound waves. And we want to minimize, as usual, the cross entropy between the data distribution over sound waves and our model distribution of the sound waves, as we've just seen on the slide before. However, this marginal distribution P of X is intractable due to this very large search space over C. Um, if we listen to a song, this, this is equivalent to um, this intuition. If we listen to a song, it's sometimes unclear what the lyrics are because there's too much noise. There's too much going on in a song. If we're listening to a song, it's sometimes not clear what the lyrics are, what the text actually was. And we're hearing words that weren't there. But if someone tells us the lyrics, we can suddenly hear it. We can verify it. That means we can assign it the right likelihood but we haven't, it was too hard for us to guess the correct lyrics. We had to have someone tell us the lyrics in order for us to suddenly understand the song. And this is what, what I mean by search space. The search space over C, over the lyrics, is too large to just draw samples from a, from a very broad prior distribution P of C. But if somebody tells us, gives us an intuition about what that C should be, it becomes suddenly much easier for us. So the search space over the word sequences that explain the sound waves is hard as there is many sequences and we might not think of the right one. Now VIEs use a recognition model Q parameterized by parameters W of C given X that computes the word sequence given an observation that tries to give us a better idea of what is in where in that latent space we are looking for a particular data point. And the, the great thing about this is that this model does not need to, need to be correct. It can be a crude approximation to P of C given X, as long as it is giving us a better intuition than just a very broad distribution, it's already useful. And training this model jointly leads to a variational autoencoder that converges much more quickly um, and becomes tractable. This is another illustration I made to explain this uh, intractability. So what we have here on the left is, um, so what we want to do is we want to compute P of X, which is the expectation over C of P uh, X given C as in the previous slides, right? And if we have, if we're looking just at the prior distribution over C, which is pretty broad, and we're drawing, so th this is the joint distribution here in green. This is this slanted Gaussian P of X given C. We have the latent code here, 
on the x variable c and then the data both are one dimensional in this simple example here on the y axis it's just x so if we want to compute p of x let's assume we want to compute the likelihood for this particular data point xi then what we would do is we would draw samples let's assume we would draw these three samples from the distribution p of c and so we get c1 c2 and c3 and then the conditional distribution p of x given c1 looks like this it's just a slice through this um, joint distribution and the conditional distribution for x given c2 would be this and the conditional distribution of x given c3 would be this just a slice a 1d slice through this 2d gaussian and we know that conditional uh, distributions of gaussians are, are also gaussians so so we have a gaussian here as well it's just a 1d gaussian in this case now because the search space c here's just one dimensional but it's actually much more high higher dimensional um, is very large um, we have just missed um, um, the uh, the data point that we want to compute the likelihood for. If we're now computing the expectation with respect to these three sample C, we see that in none of them, the likelihood model gives us a high probability. While actually, if we would compute um, a sample here, we would have significant probability for that particular data point. So we have done a very bad approximation to P of X. We have underestimated the probability of x. On the other hand, if we have a recognition model q of z that's conditioned on xi, if we have a neural network that tells us that the parameters of a distribution here in blue, given a particular xi, and if that prediction is, is, is roughly correct, that, that is, it's not super sharp, but it's, it's um, narrowing down the search space compared to this broad distribution and we draw three samples from this distribution as you can see then um, we sample that likelihood or the, the, the samples that we draw to compute the likelihood are are much better now so we actually find um, the right probability for that sample in our words but that's the intuition now um, what we do is we seek a tractable, using this recognition model Q, which I'm from now on always highlight in red. Um, I ignore the parameters for clarity here, but I highlight the recognition model Q in red. What we do is we trying to using this recognition model to seek a tractable, low, tractable lower bound to the likelihood, which is called elbow evidence lower bound because it's a lower bound to the log likelihood, which is sometimes called the evidence. It's the evidence of the observations that we make. So the log likelihood can be rewritten as the expectation over C. So we're not changing anything because we are, um, uh, we're just adding this expectation over C and then we're adding uh, two terms here that cancel. And so these cancel. So this expectation doesn't matter, right? So it's kind of a trick. We're, we're adding something that doesn't matter to this equation. Um, so, so when we have done this, then we can, um, well, we can um, write this expression here as the joint distribution. This is just a joint distribution. And then we can uh, add another term, Q of C given X that cancels also. So we haven't changed the equation again, but we had, have added another term. So we divide this first term here by Q of C given X, and then we divide Q of C given X by P of C given X, which is this, this term here. So we haven't changed anything. And we have uh, pulled them apart through the logarithm rule. Now, what we can see now is, um, if we take the expectation of the first, this is this first expression, but if we take the expectation of this term with respect to C, then we have the kullback leibler divergence between Q and P. This is what I've written here. This is just the definition of the kullback leibler divergence between Q and P. And what we know is that this kullback leibler divergence is always bigger or equal to zero. 
That means that this expression here is always bigger or equal than this expression because we have, we have removed a term that's bigger than zero. And this is called the elbow. It's the evidence lower bound. It's a lower bound due to this inequality to the data log likelihood. And as we'll see, this lower bound is now tractable. In practice, Q is a variational approximation to the two posterior as Q is represented um, by a family of functions parametrized in, in our case for a neural network. So this can be considered as a variational problem. We are varying a function. And therefore the elbow is sometimes also called a variational lower bound. And the divergence here measures the approximation error between the recognition model, the approximate recognition model and the true posterior. But that is um, um, intractable to compute. Now, the negative log likelihood is um, therefore upper bounded. So here we had the log likelihood. Now we take the negative log likelihood. So we have the upper bound. So we are, we are changing this lower bound to an upper bound and we are changing Q and P because we have a negative sign here. So this is upper bounded by this expression. And uh, this expression here is just this expression if we pull apart um, P of C and X into the conditional and the prior on C. So it's just the definition of the joint distribution. And so we can also write this expression as just the first term divided by P of C minus log P of X uh, given C. So it's just pulling this apart. Then if we write it like this, we can see again that now this expression is a Kullback like Leibler divergence, but in this case, a tractable one. It's one between Q, the recognition model, and the prior on C. And we, we choose the prior and the recognition model such that this, this is tractable to compute. And we'll see that. And on the right-hand side, we have... Um, the expectation of the negative, the conditional um, negative log likelihood x given c with respect to c. So this bound comprises a KL divergence term and a conditional log likelihood. This term is often also called the reconstruction error. This is a term that measures how close the recognition model distribution is to the prior that we put on, on the latent space. So regularizer on the latent space, if you will, and the right hand side is a reconstruction error that measures how good our reconstructions, here we're doing a reconstruction, given C we're reconstructing X, but now probabilistically, so we're, we, we're obtaining a distribution over X, how good that is with respect to the data points that we have observed. Note how Q of C given X and P of X given C act as an autoencoder here. We have Q as the encoder that maps from X to C, and we have P as the decoder that maps from C to X. And that's why it's called a variational autoencoder because it has this, out of these equations, there, there emerges this autoencoding structure that is, if you implement it in a computer, is implemented. And this is the variational autoencoder. So let's assume there's a data set X, X1 to Xn, um, Xi are the, elements in that data set and W the model parameters, then the variational autoencoder minimizes this bound that we've just seen to the negative log likelihood. So we're trying to find W star, which is a minimizer over all the data points to this negative log likelihood, um, which comprises a uh, approximate posterior, uh, um, like a, a measure that measures the different discrepancy between the approximate posterior or the recognition model and the prior and the reconstruction term. And in a VAE, this recognition model is uh, chosen as a multivariate Gaussian parameterized by a neural network, which makes, which makes the computation of the KL term very simple. And, and therefore it makes this uh, variational approximation to the true posterior. That's why it's called a variational approximation. Q is a variational approximation to the true posterior because it's parameterized by such a distribution or implemented by such a parameterized distribution.
And the likelihood P of X given C is also parameterized by a neural network. For binary observations, it's um, chosen as Bernoulli. For real observations, as we'll see later on, it's um, chosen as either Gaussian or Laplacian. If it's chosen as Gaussian, then as we know, this term will become a, a squared term if we execute the negative logarithm of a Gaussian. Now, what do I mean when I say here that the likelihood model P of X given C or the recognition model Q of C given X are Gaussians parameterized by a neural network? What I mean, let's consider the recognition model. What I mean is that we have a recognition model, but it's analogous for um, the the prior or the uh, not the um, the, rec the uh, reconstruction uh, the likelihood model. So it's the same thing. It's just let's assume let's consider the recognition model here. So we have the recognition model. This is a distribution over C given X that's parameterized by this multivariate Gaussian expression here. It's just a standard expression for a Gaussian where the parameters that are the covariance matrix and the mean vector are functions of x of the input because they're conditioned on this model is this distribution is conditioned on x and uh, depend on the parameters w and are implemented through a neural network there's a neural network that after several layers like an mlp predicts sigma and mu from x and the sigma and mu are then considered the parameters of the Gaussian distribution. And often they share the same backbone. So um, sigma and mu share the same backbone and then only at the head it branches out and predicts sigma and mu. And typically we don't consider the full covariance matrix because we operate in relatively high dimensional latent spaces. I mean, uh, too high dimensional to represent a covariance matrix. So we, uh, in variational autoencoders, we typically make the assumption that this is a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal we have the, uh, the elements are the individual uh, variances in each dimension. And these elements are then predicted. So we have Q sigmas to predict and we have Q mu elements to predict from X with our neural network. So this is a slide that uh, just briefly shows um, that assuming a Gaussian recognition model and a Gaussian prior. So we've talked about the recognition model, but the prior is also chosen often as a Gaussian and often it's even chosen as a Gaussian without any parameters um, where we have just a, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, which is a standard Gaussian distribution, mean zero and identity covariance matrix. And here we drop the dependency for clarity, the dependency of Q, um, mu and sigma on X and W, just to have less clutter in these equations. And if we um, observe that for this, this first uh, integral here and the second integral here, we, we obtain this, um, this closed form expressions because these are Gaussians, so you can verify this. Um, then we can express also the kullback leibler divergence between Q and P, which is also a, a, int, uh, a integral expression. We can represent this also with an analytic solution. So what this tells us is that the KL term in the case of a Gaussian recognition model and a Gaussian prior has a simple analytical solution. And this is the standard setup that's used because that's easy to, to differentiate. We don't need to solve an integral. That would be intractable, but we have a very simple a term here that's only summing up a bunch of um, parameters mu and sigma over the um, uh, latent dimension uh, up to that should be q. Um, yeah, and the covariance matrix is of the recognition model is typically chosen as, as a diagonal. So we have basically here we have only the diagonal elements uh, sigma i at uh, sigma j in this expression. And we can already see that if mu is zero, let's say, and, and sigma is um, the same, then we get, we get uh, um, uh, uh, sigma is one, then we get zero for this expression. So we can already get an intuition that this kullback leibler divergence is zero when uh, both the recognition model and the prior predict the same distribution. So it makes sense.
Okay, so so far about the intuition. So this is the variational autoencoder objective again that minimizes over all the data points this KL term and the reconstruction term. As we have seen in this setting where we assume Gaussians, the gradients for the KL term with respect to W are easily obtained using backprop. Um, uh, but for the reconstruction term, while the forward pass can be easily computed using sampling, so here we have a sampling operation and we can just draw samples and then compute um, that term, um, the backward pass requires differentiation through a sampling operation. Okay, we have the sampling operation here and the distribution that we sample from depends on parameters itself. And this is, this is not nice. This is not, this is, this is, we, we can derive a estimator for this, but it's a very high variance estimator. That's not very useful um, for our purposes. And so what Kingma and Welling proposed in their variational autoencoder paper, paper is to use a trick trick that was known before, but that has been applied to the first time to this type of variational inference problem. It's called the reparameterization trick. And that trick moves the sampling um, that we have here from being inside the computation graph of the neural network to the input. So here on the left, we have the sampling that's, that's part of the computation. But what, what we can do for many distributions, such as uh, Gaussians, we can sample from a standard Gaussian, and then we can um, uh, we can uh, uh, basically uh, do a linear transformation of the mean that's now a deterministic function. So the difference here is now the mean is a deterministic function as a neural network with parameters w that deterministically depends on x, not stochastically like here. Um, and sigma is also a deterministic function of x. Um, so this is a this is a deterministic mapping that now depends on a variable that's sampled, but for backpropagation to the parameters w here, we have a deterministic relationship. So this is the trick. We reparameterize in order to obtain a deterministic relationship for backpropagation while moving the sampling operation to the input layer. And uh, it turns out that actually in practice a single sample epsilon per data point x often sufficient uh, is sufficient uh, depending on the mini batch size if you have reasonably large mini batch sizes 64 or 128 then a single sample gives you um, low variance gradient uh, 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 predictions so here's a picture of the two variants with and without reparameterization trick this is the one without this is a vanilla vae um, we assume a Gaussian likelihood model P of X given C in this example. So this is simply a L2 reconstruction error then. And we see that we have this, this uh, nasty sampling operation that's, that's inside our computation graph. Now, if we switch to the reparameterized version, which is tractable as the sampling now has been moved outside into the input and we can backpropagate gradients now through this deterministic process here. And this is what the reparameterization re trick does. And yeah, uh, apart from this reconstruction loss, which is L2 for a Gaussian likelihood, we have, of course, also the KL term here, which is on, which is a regularizer on the recognition model, which is the encoder in this case. This trick works for Gaussians and some other simple distributions like exponential family and there's more details in the Kingma paper if you're interested. One remark about expressiveness. VIEs are very expressive. And uh, to illustrate this, that like a, a mapping, what they effectively implement is a mapping from a latent space. So we have a latent distribution. That's a very simple distribution. It's a normal, a standard normal distribution on latent space. But then we have a nonlinear mapping here that takes this a uh, Gaussian, standard Gaussian distributed sample in the latent space and maps that to the reconstruction, to the prediction. And because we have this nonlinear transformation here through a neural network that's very expressive, we can take that standard distribution and realize something that's very complex in terms of the output distribution. And this is illustrated here for a simple toy example where I've chosen the nonlinear mapping uh, manually, 
Um, so here's uh, some samples from a standard Gaussian distribution. And here on the right, these samples are mapped. So this is the mean mapping, basically. It's a neural network that maps e the mean of each of these samples. Um, with this function c uh, over 10 and then c over the norm of c. And so we get a much more complex distribution um, that is, uh, you know, that, that doesn't have this Gaussian uh, unimodal shape here. It's a distribution that distribu disperses these points on a ring. And so by stacking these nonlinear transformations, we can transform these very simple distributions into very complex distributions. And that's what a VAE does as well. So VAE uh, basically models the mean and the uh, covariance vectors as neural networks that map the input um, to um, uh, the output. And they also, um, that's, uh, that map the latent code to the output. So finally, let's look at some results. This is the um, learned manifolds uh, that we've already seen for faces and for MNIST. You can see how this VAE captures naturally the underlying structure of this data set. Here is some visualization of random samples. Now we have a generative model we can also draw random samples from. We can <clears throat> uh, basically here, uh, draw a random uh, a latency from a standard Gaussian distribution, and then we can apply the decoder and obtain a reconstruction for it. And um, yeah, and uh, that is that is what is uh, illustrated here. And we see this for different dimensionalities of latent spaces, and you can see that also if we increase the latent space dimensionality, of course, we get better samples. Then um, I want to show you some other applications of VAEs finally. Um, VAEs have been, as mentioned in the beginning already, applied in, in numerous domains. So this is just a sh very short overview of where they have been applied. This is the VA, uh, the draw model that I've shown already in, in the very beginning of this lecture, where um, a sequential VAE is used to read digits and also to sequentially generate digits and other images. So this is a sequential application. It's a combination of a VAE with a recurrent neural network. This is called a, a deep convolutional inverse graphics network where we have a VAE on, uh, com in combination with a convolutional neural network and a special training um, scheme through weak supervision that forces the model to disentangle latent factors such as pose, lighting, texture, and shape without actually putting a lot of supervision into that. So you can see that we can have uh, the reconstructions that match the uh, originals quite well. This is from 2015, so results are much better today. And we can see what, what happens if you change some of these latent codes, like the, the pose gets changed in this case, or here, um, uh, in this case, the elevation, and in this case, the azimuth of the pose get changed. In this case, the VAEs have been applied to motion forecasting from a static image where the goal is um, to predict how the motion could continue. And it's, of course, important that this prediction can be multimodal because it's from a single image is very uncertain um, what the motion should be. And so you want to have plausible motions, but they can, can be in different directions. And this is a state-of-the-art um, VAE model. It's called Vector Quantized Variational Autoencoder that produces Samples, these are random samples from the model that are almost competitive with state-of-the-art generative adversarial networks that we will um, learn about in the last lecture. And this is um, the results that I've shown you already uh, from our occupancy network paper, where you can also see how we learn a latent space visualized here in these two dimensions only of cars and other objects of 3D shapes. And we can use this, um, this VAE also to learn context embeddings. For instance, in this case, this is a paper on self-driving where we're trying to uh, learn expert policies, but these expert policies should be informed by the environment. And so we can, we can learn a lot about the environment just by driving around, just by observing the environment. We can learn a reconstruction of that environment. And that latent code that we learn as a byproduct serves as a very useful cue 
to solve the driving task. So we can then drive in very, um, this is in simulation, it's called the Kala simulator. So we use that simulator to test our driving algorithms and it allows us to drive in very complex and challenging scenes where we have a lot of uh, variability in the observations and a lot of clutter and a lot of pedestrians walking around that we try to uh, not hurt. That's all for today. Thanks.